Hello and welcome to Hazard and Hope. I'm Ed and in this episode we're going to be looking at what makes up flood water and the different things we can do to reduce the range of contaminants and debris that we find within it. So here we go. Now it's easy to think of flood water as just being muddy water that comes from a river. But the reality is it can derive from a variety of different sources and be a potent mixture of some very dangerous elements. In this episode, we're going to look at the hazards associated with these different ingredients and then move on to consider what can actually be done to reduce the volume and type of contaminants within this mix. And one of the first things to note is that a number of these items are actually quite natural elements. And in many ways, part of the way in which nutrients are redistributed when an area floods through natural processes. But even with just these ingredients in alone, flood water is still extremely hazardous, particularly you think of the devastating power of things like mud flows. What I'm going to do next is actually add together these different items into this tank to recreate a flood water mix. And I'll talk through the various hazards associated with each of the different ingredients. Right, so we've got the tank, got all these different items, lovely glasses and gloves. And we're going to begin by looking at some of the more artificial elements and then move on to more natural types of debris a bit later on because these are going to cloud up the water and make it difficult to see. From the outset though, I just want to be really clear that this is not something to try at home or to mess around with in any way. You know, it's really important that we're aware of the significant threat that flood water can pose. To begin with, we have the water itself. Now, this is a substance can of course be incredibly dangerous, particularly where there are strong currents, deep depths or high velocity flows. It may well be that the floods are actually from a coastal context and that this is a saltwater mixture. Now that can cause the corrosion of materials, can lead to the contamination of freshwater aquifers and significantly affect the fertility of agricultural lands. As floodwaters rise and move across different terrains, they can also come into contact with things like power lines. Now these could well have been knocked down by the storms that brought the rain or waves, but when submerged, these can pose a major risk to life and sadly lead to things like electric shock drowning. It's also very common to see a variety of different electrical goods, such as TVs or computers, or even headphones, being caught up in flood water and becoming part of that mix. Next, we've got important documents. So this could be things like birth certificates, passports, insurance details, or even cherished objects and photos that may well be irreplaceable. And when these come into contact with flood water, they can be damaged beyond repair. Things like toilet paper, sanitary products, and even human feces can also find their way into this mix, particularly if sewage pipes have surcharged. It may well also be that there's actual animal excrement within the flood water itself. Well, that could well have been washed off neighboring fields, farms, or parks. And this particular stuff's actually from our chickens. Sharp objects like glass, nails, and even needles can also find their way into flood water. We'll be able to see these for now, but when we add in some of the sand and soil in a minute and the water becomes murky, it'll be a lot more difficult to see. So we need to remember that these different items are going to be sitting in that sludge and slurry that remains after the water recedes. Vehicles can also be very easily picked up and carried by flood water. It only takes about six inches of water to make a car become unstable, between one and two feet, depending on the type of vehicle, to actually make it float. We can also find that corrosive substances such as bleach and battery acid are part of this flood water mix. And poisonous ones like pesticides and herbicides can also be washed in when garage or storage areas flood. And when you think about something like fertilizer, I mean, this can increase nitrogen levels if it gets into watercourses and lead to the pollution of marine ecosystems. Now things like oil, petrol and diesel can also be caught up in flood water particularly when it flows through industrial areas, you know, over fuel stations, or when cars become inundated. Now it is also common to find a variety of different types of food waste and fat in within flood water, particularly when kitchens and bin storage areas flood. It can also be that pots of paint are knocked over, so we'll add some of that into the mix as well. Now flood water obviously poses a huge hazard to people. I mean, it only takes a very shallow depth of water, moving at high velocity to knock you off your feet. But it can also be that animals are also caught up and drown in flood water or die from exposure to these different contaminants. So we've got Rob the Rat here that we're going to pop in as a symbol to represent the hazard that flood water poses to both human and animal life. 
Floodwater can also exert significant physical loads on buildings and at times lead to structural damage. So you may well see building materials like bricks and tiles are picked up and become part of this debris. But those forces will also be shifting gravel from driveways and riverbeds and moving rocks and even large boulders the size of cars. Now as water washes over fields and land, it's also going to be picking up natural debris like leaves, sticks, branches and even trees. Now these can cause blockages in culverts and bridges with the water that backlogs spreading into surrounding areas. In pretty much all cases though, flood water is going to be carrying with it some degree of silt, sand and soil, so we're going to add these in as the final elements. So when we put all these different ingredients together, you know, what we can see is that we have a really very potent and dangerous mix. I mean, you've got poisonous chemicals, large bits of heavy debris like cars and trees, the risk of electrocution, as well as sharp objects and many different types of biological matter. Now, visibility wise, you know, from above, you really can't see what's at the bottom. And so if you're to be walking through this, there's really no way for you to know if you're about to step on a pothole or an open drain or one of those nails that we put in just now. There are also a range of very nasty water and vector-borne diseases that can spread through flood water. But we also need to acknowledge that floods can have a significant psychological as well as physical impact on human health. You know, the damage isn't just done to bricks and mortar, and we really need to help people through that process of recovery. Now as the flood waters recede, what we're left with is a pretty disgusting and potent sludge of foul-smelling contaminants. Now this will need to be disposed of appropriately so that it doesn't pollute surrounding ecosystems and any surface or item that has come into contact with this flood water will need to be properly decontaminated. So we've just seen all these items come together in the tank and the foul mix that flood water can be. But now what we're going to do is take a step back and actually consider what can be done to reduce the volume and type of contaminants that end up in flood water. Now one of the main things we can do is actually to alter the location or position of these different items so they're actually just not exposed to flood risk. Now that might be a permanent or a temporary move, but at the larger strategic scale, we can locate things like chemical and industrial plants away from watercourses and actually look to decontaminate polluted land that has or will be exposed to flood risk. But in terms of limiting the uptake of these different chemical compounds into flood water, I think it's actually really important that we question fundamentally the nature and extent of their use throughout industry, agriculture and beyond, because they can have a devastating impact on ecosystems and the natural environment. And where they do have to be used, we really need to make sure that's done so in a manner in which we minimise all of the risk of them finding their way into flood water and watercourses. In terms of reducing pollution levels in runoff, we can use things like reed beds or bioretention cells to actually treat runoff but these do need to be properly managed and maintained because obviously they're not going to be suited to cope with every single one of these different ingredients. It's also really important to consider actually how and where we position things like our critical infrastructure and utilities, be that waste, power or water, because we want them to be future-proof. We need them to continue to function before, during and after a flood event. When it comes to things like vehicles, we can reduce a lot of the risk by actually listening to the flood warnings and relocating vehicles to lower risk areas prior to a flood event. But it's really important to remember that we should never ever drive through flood water. You know, if your vehicle breaks down, you could get trapped inside, but putting yours and your fellow passengers' lives at risk, as well as those of the people who may well be sent out to rescue you. Now unfortunately, a lot of damage and debris will come from within our homes and businesses when a property floods. But it's crucial to remember that there are ways that we can actually make a property flood resilient. We can keep water out of a building by making it flood resistant and fitting things like flood doors and automatic air bricks to actually limit water entry. But it's important to be aware that this kind of resistance-based approach isn't going to be suited for every building type or flood risk context. What we can also do is design properties to be flood recoverable, so that we actually limit the impact that flood water causes when it comes inside a building. In this approach, we'd look to use materials that are more water compatible, so don't swell or distort when in contact with flood water as well as those that can be dried, cleaned, and reinstated more easily. Items like tables, chairs, or kitchen cabinet doors can also be specified and detailed so that they're actually more easily lifted, folded, or disassembled prior to a flood event so that we can keep them out of harm's way. There are also a number of devices we can use that will help limit the extent to which sewage and drainage systems come into this flood water. So things like non-return valves can actually help avoid the backflow and surcharge of sewage systems and we can even fit things like lockable manhole covers so that actually when that flood water rises, it doesn't take the manhole cover with it and we minimise the cross-contamination within those streams. 
Now with things like sanitary, medical and food waste, again, we can change the position of these to reduce their exposure to flood risk. But it might well also be that we choose to put them into lockable boxes or vessels so that if they do get tipped over, their contents aren't going to be added into this mix. Now that same logic applies to things like important documents and cherished possessions. You know, it might well be that you move or store these in a part of the property that will be at lower risk of flooding, but it can also make sense to have them backed up on the cloud just so that you're extra safe. There are a number of hard engineering interventions that can reduce the velocity, depth and amount of particulates that end up in flood water. But natural flood management strategies such as tree planting and overland sediment traps can also help to reduce overland and river flow rates, as well as the amount of debris being washed into a watercourse. This means that larger debris such as rocks and boulders aren't being as easily or often picked up and transported downstream. Ultimately, whilst there's a lot that we can do to minimise the amount of contaminants that go into this mix, we should never just assume that it's harmless muddy water. It's dangerous to come into any sort of contact with, and you never know what's been picked up and lies within it. Now, obviously this isn't an exhaustive collection of every single item that can possibly find its way into flood water, but hopefully what it has provided is an overview of some of the ingredients it can contain, help to highlight why we need to be treating it with extreme caution, and what can be done to adapt. And we'd love to hear from you about the different types of systems and strategies that you yourself may have seen that can help to reduce the amount of contaminants that end up in flood water. Thanks very much for listening. If you'd like to keep updated on future episodes, please subscribe below, hit the bell for notifications, and we'll look forward to seeing you soon.